to operate within the system sometimes mm. because you have all these things that are saying, all right, this is what I, to- I taught you. This is what I told you to do. And then when you don't do it, these are the consequences. Yeah. And that yeah. must have been so frustrating with you because you would want to help these people, but you yep. had to give them a certain prescription. Trying to figure out how to how to tell them to do something Yeah, without incriminating myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we got the Dr. Bobby Price here today. Going to bust some food myths and some health myths. Thanks for uh, coming on, man. Man, excited to be here. I know we've been working on this for a while. A while, almost a year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah dude. Finally here, man. I'm glad to be here, man. Absolutely. Love your content. Thanks, dude. And yeah. your story from working for the FDA, pharmacy, to now being what you're doing now is crazy. Yeah, it is. It it's, is. It's not normal. It's not normal. You know why it's not normal? Why? The intention and the purpose. Mm. See, what happens is... In, this is just my personal opinion is if your idea is to become a healthcare professional, a doctor, if that's your purpose, then you just become a, a doctor. Mm. That's it. And whatever is regurgitated is going to be regurgitated and indoctrinated. Mm. But when your whole purpose was, I really want to help people. I really want to heal people. When you get to the end of the road and you become a doctor, but you're not actually healing people. It's like, what am I here for? Wow. So that's what really changed the story so much is because every time I got to another pole, it was like, okay, I'm not serving purpose. This isn't getting what I, getting done what I want to get done. Right. Yeah. And I think it's hard for many people to make that transition because they spend their whole lives in education yep. becoming a doctor. Yep. So now they realize a big part of their life is a lie. Yep. Uh, uh, not only is it a lie, but what's difficult about it is you've been indoctrinated 10 years. So just think about it. Four years of undergrad for me, two science degrees. Mm. Four years of graduate school, another year or two of residency. Mm. That's 10 years. Yeah. 10 years of indoctrination. And those are prime years too. Prime years. Like your most impressionable years in terms of like you going from a child to an adult. Mm -hmm. And I think what's also, when I say indoctrination, what I mean by that is when we come out of school and we go through residency and now we have to treat patients, the difficult thing is that what people don't know is that it's literally a guideline to follow that says, if this, then this, this, this. Mm. If you got hypertension and you're black, and then you get this. If you got diabetes and you, your blood glucose is this level, you get this. Mm. So there's not a lot of thought process in it. There's not a lot of creativity in mm. figuring out what's going on specifically with this patient. Right. So as a result of that, that's what you do. You'll notice that a lot of times when you go into a doctor, they ask you a couple of questions, they type it into a system, <laughs> it regurgitates what they should give <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah. And the other thing is, there's a lot of good doctors out there, but the other thing is it opens you up to malpractice if you don't follow those guidelines. Wow, I didn't so know the, that. So a lot of people don't understand that. So it's very difficult to, to operate within the system sometimes mm. because you have all these things that are saying, all right, this is what I, to- I taught you. This is what I told you to do. And then when you don't do it, these are the consequences. Yeah, and that yeah. must have been so frustrating with you because you would want to help these people, but yep. you had to give them a certain prescription. Trying to figure out how to how to tell them to do something yeah. without incriminating myself. <laughs> or like, cause like specifically for me, like I got diagnosed with high blood pressure when I was 16. Damn, that's early. Like, and I was an athlete, 7% body fat, great in football, great in basketball, went on to college to play basketball as well too, but I got diagnosed when I was 16. Mm. Lived with it for over a decade finally become a healthcare professional in the hospital. I'm taking medications in my late 20s. Wow. And essentially what happened was at that point, it's like, okay, I'm trying to give people advice. I'm trying to tell people how to heal themselves, but I haven't healed myself yet. Mm. And so that's when the journey actually started for me was like, all right, so how do I heal myself? Because, you know, everybody pretty much every other person who comes in here has high blood pressure. Right. So it's kind of ironic you're giving them advice and medication, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt like a hypocrite. Yeah. So did you find out what caused it? Well, it was a lot of factors. Like for me, I had a very, uh, and we talked about it earlier, but I had a very troubling childhood. Mm. You know, by the time I was 12 years old, I had witnessed a friend kill another friend with a bat. Damn. You know, my best friend and cousin, he was killed in a police chase. Um... 
you know, I lost all of my grandparents by the time I was- As a B2B marketer, you know how noisy the ad space can be. If your message isn't targeted to the right audience, it just disappears into the noise. With LinkedIn ads, you could precisely reach the professionals who are more likely to find your ad relevant with LinkedIn targeting capabilities. You can reach them by job title, industry, company, and more. Stand out with LinkedIn ads and start converting your B2B audience into high quality leads today. LinkedIn ads allows you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. You'll have direct access to and build relationships with decision makers. A billion members are on their platform, 180 million senior level executives and 10 million C-level executives. You'll be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B in technology. LinkedIn generated two to five X higher return on ad spend than any other social media platform. And you'll work with a partner who respects the B2B world you operate in. 79% of B2B content marketers said LinkedIn produces the best results for paid media. LinkedIn has been a great platform for me to also find interesting podcast guests. If you're interested, start converting your B2B audience into high quality leads today. We'll give you $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash social to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash social. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be. I was 15. Whoa. And uh, I was very much in love with my grandmother. Like she was my um, backbone. Hmm. And so a lot of it was trauma, like unresolved trauma. Hmm. But the other part was this unhealthy sort of culture of food. Right. You know, and, and it's unfortunate, but like, especially, you know, in the African American culture, like our food kills us. Hmm. And when you look at the food that is in our neighborhoods and underserved neighborhoods, it's mostly fast food restaurants. Right. You know, when you look at the grocery stores, like what's available, it's not the same things that are available in good neighborhoods. And so as a result of I was living that, I was eating that. And mm. then I took those habits, you know, on to college or whatever. But that was really the baseline and foundation of why I started to get hypertension. It was a combination of unresolved trauma, but also eating essentially the standard American diet. Right, and yeah. that's one of the worst diets in the world, right? Worse, by, by far, like, and we're gonna talk about this in a second, but America's food is banned in over 30 countries. Jeez. And I'm talking about some of the major food groups, chicken, banned in other countries, dairy, banned in other countries, <sighs> you know, pork, banned in other countries, wow. corn, banned in other countries. So when you start to go down our food list, our food is banned here, and it's mostly because of how that food is processed, how those animals are treated. And when I say treated, I'm not I'm not talking about do they get a pet on them or something like that. <laughs> I'm talking about what happens when they feed the animal. Most of these animals are getting genetically modified corn and mm. soy. That's not what they're designed to eat. You know, uh, a lot of the animals are treated with a lot of arsenic or put in their feed like chickens. Mm. Rectopamine is put in the feed of uh, pigs, all to make them bigger and grow. The fed antibiotics, hormones. So you start to see why our food is so, you know, uh, toxic. Right. You know, and then you look at, you know, everything else on the shelf. Most of it has food chemicals in it. You know, thickening agents, emulsifiers, preservatives, red number three, red number 40, yellow number five, mm -hmm. all of these things. Nobody knows what they are. But because I have a chemistry background, all of these things, they, they, I have a, def, a definition for them. As soon as I see them, I know what it's used for on the synthetic side of chemistry. Mm. But it should never be used on the organic side of chemistry, which is us. Right. Yeah. Yeah, those food dyes, man. As a kid, you just eat those thinking it's yeah. just, you know, normal. But those are now proving to cause diseases. So. Yeah, and not only diseases, but ADD, ADHD. We'll talk about this as, as well, but red number three and red number 40 also feminize young boys and men as really? well too. It lowers testosterone levels? Not only lowers testosterone levels, but elevates estrogen in the body. Wow. And that's really important because we look at this stuff and we think to ourselves, well, they put the red number three and red number 40 in there to make it red, you know, to give it this appearance where it looks good. Yeah. Because if you take the food chemicals out, the food not only doesn't look edible, <laughs> but it doesn't taste that way either. Oh, wow. And, you know, and I lived in Japan for like four and a half years, and I would watch TV, and one of the programs they had on there yeah. was that they would have, like, Japanese kids, like, taste testing American food, mm. and they would be eating, like, Pop-Tarts and be like, it tastes like cardboard. <laughs> but it's because our taste buds are so immature 
Yeah. And so they're so in alignment with what processed food is because we grow up on that. Mm. Like that's the foundation of what most, as a matter of fact, if you look at somebody who's less than 25 years old, for the most part, if you live in America, most people have grown up, 70% of their diet has been processed food. Jeez, that yeah. is That's the standard American diet, Holy 70, crap. 70%. So when you were living in the blue zone, it was probably the opposite, right? You were probably eating 80% natural. Yeah, so I lived in Okinawa, Japan, and that was a, how that experience came about was amazing because I had started my journey in the hospital and finally got to a point where I healed myself of my high blood pressure. I was 50 pounds overweight, sleep apnea, et cetera. And then out of the blue, I realized that I wasn't gonna be able to function within the system. Mm. You know, I was, having people who were coming up there, like asking me for like the natural prescription and yeah. all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I just realized I wasn't gonna be able to survive in the system. And so I literally left my job and was trying to figure out what I was gonna do. And out of the blue, I get this opportunity to go to Okinawa, Japan. Mm. And I had been reading a book called Ikigai, which means in, in Japanese to find your purpose in life. And um, so when the opportunity came, like this is perfect because Okinawa is a blue zone. Mm. And a blue zone is essentially one of the five zones in the world where people live the longest. They have the the the, the highest amount of centenarians. And so I'm like, this is a perfect opportunity. I could actually see what it looks like to live a long life. Now, yeah. at this time, I'm plant-based. I had stopped eating meat, dairy, all animal products. I didn't go there under the impression that the vast majority of their diet would be that because I was under the assumption that most Asian diets included a lot of fish, included mm. a lot of this and that. But when I get there, I find out that it's a blue zone. And then not only that, I find out that there's a particular village in Okinawa called Ogumi Village mm. that has the highest amount of centenarians. So it wasn't actually Okinawa itself. It was this village. Oh, OK. And a lot of people don't know that. And I think that's important to mention because what m most people don't know about Okinawa too is it has a lot of military, American military bases there. Mm. So as a result, a lot of influence in American culture has taken place in Okinawa as well too. Got it. So now you're starting to see some of the fast food restaurants mm. become popular. But on the northern part of the island, o in Ogimi Village, you don't see that. You have people who are living the way they lived 50, 60 years ago. And so I take an opportunity to go to one of the military libraries and I'm looking at what they were eating 50, 60 years ago when after the war happened, they had the highest amount of centenarians then as well too. Mm. It was, it, so it wasn't a new thing. And so at that point it was like, all right, so let me go to the village and see what they're doing. And I go there and I see people who are 90, 92, 105, still walking, wow. still gardening, you know, walking up hills, riding bikes, having fluid conversations. And as you know, here in America, when somebody's 80, <laughs> <laughs> at that point, they probably had dementia. They're in a wheelchair. Exactly. And so to see people who are strong, who are like, I saw an 86 year old man climbing a tree. Wow. And so like to see that for myself, I'm like, okay, so this is how you're supposed to be. Yeah. When you live a good life. And so watching their diet and I'm seeing what they're eating. And I'm realizing that somewhere around 90 to 95% of the diets is plants. Mm. And then a small percentage, five to 10% is a little bit of fish. Um, and then sometimes a little bit of pork, but they use the meat for flavoring. They don't use it primarily for the meat as protein. Right, right. They're like flavoring their, their vegetables. Yeah. And so, you know, watching their lifestyles, including herbs in their diets, uh, including things like mugwort, turmeric, uh, including principles and philosophies that are also helpful as well too, like harahachibu, mm. which means eat only to 80%, mm. which is scientifically proven because when you get to like 80% full, your brain has a 20% lag time. Mm. So it doesn't even know that it's full yet because there's a lag time between the brain and the gut. Wow. So when you get to 80%, guess what? You're already full. That's interesting. And then when you eat to full, you're full, full. Yeah. So like learning those type of principles, learning things like how they interact in communities, 
how they'll have somebody who's 80 years old who is considered young in the village <laughs> paired up with somebody who's 98 years old. Wow. And they would be responsible for each other. Interesting. You know, so it was just a beautiful opportunity to see what we look like, our ancestors look like maybe 100 years ago, not only in Okinawa and the four other four blue zones, but traditionally speaking, that's how it looked because you go back maybe 60 years ago, you go into a a, a store because there were no supermarkets and there's no organic se- section because everything is organic. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Farmer's market, right? Yeah, I mean, farmer's market directly to the farmer. You know, like the way we're eating today is totally different from the way our great-grandmother ate, mm. our great-grandfather ate. And so a lot of times what happens is people will say, well, my, my granddaddy smoked a pack of cigarettes. Well, for about 40 years, he ate nothing but organic food, no GMO. GMO didn't come into place until the early 2000s. Yeah. You know, didn't have to worry about all these pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides. Didn't have to worry about EMF coming from computers, TV, cell phones. Mm. A lot of things that have happened in the last 30 years have shifted everything. Yeah, the lifespan's dropping pretty rapidly, actually. And not only lifespan, but quality of life. Right. Because people can live to 80, but the last 20 years of their life, they may be in the home. Mm. They got dementia. They got type 1 diabetes. They lose an arm, a, le- a limb, et cetera. So, yeah, people are living to 80, but, like, the quality of life years are diminishing, like, greatly. Yeah, that's scary, man. Yeah. Are you still primarily vegetarian? Uh, well, I'm, I'm vegan. Okay. And so I use air quotes because the unfortunate thing is I think the vegan movement has been hijacked. Mm. And a large percentage of the foods that people who are vegan are eating are vegan junk foods. Mm. They're not eating plants. And a lot of that is be, is because of the vegan movement itself was really a movement based on, you know, the protection of animals. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily for health. That wasn't the basis of the movement. Mm. And so as a result of that, there's no emphasis on health. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I don't necessarily so am I technically vegan? Yes. But I eat plants. Got it. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think that's really important because at the end of the day, what I've learned is the most important thing is to eat real food. Mm. It's not a matter of what label you want to put on yourself. It's are you eating real food that is free of food chemicals, that is free of pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides, that has been picked properly, harvested properly, and grown properly. Yeah, so you yeah. don't shop at grocery stores. I wouldn't say I don't shop at grocery stores, but when I do everything – there's only a few things that I'm I'm very particular about getting. Got it. Because I own a farm. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. I oh, that's a, cool. I own a tropical fruit farm, and of course, I grow my own. I grow my own vegetables on there as well, too. Nice. So you know, like a large percentage of my food and fruit is coming from my farm. That's how it should be, right? Everyone should have their own little community and have a farmer in there. That, that's how it was. Like even before the Second World War. Most people had a what a, what were called gardens or victory gardens. Mm. You know that was a big thing during World War War Two. Mm-hmm. And what happened was during World War Two was where all of the processed food. This is where processed foods began, because they were creating what are called MREs for the soldiers, food that could last a long period of time on the battlefield. Mm. Because in World War One, what they learned was most so- soldiers died due to famine. Wow. A lack of food, a lack of nutrition. You know, um, you know, something like a, a B vitamin deficiency could cause a condition like pellagra. Mm. You know, where somebody literally could go crazy. And so, a lot of times, what what they learned through that process was that all right, so we got to figure out how to create some food that could be packaged that could last for a long time, and that's how processed foods were created. And what happened was the technology was then given to the public. And this was where fast food became the fast food that we know today. Right. You see what I'm saying? So that's why for me, when I go into the grocery store, if I buy anything, it's going to be organic. So if I, you know, let's say, for instance, I'm short on ginger root. Mm. So I go get my ginger root, making sure it's organic. Okay. Uh, Maybe I go there because, you know, I, I actually get my water delivered to me. So I wouldn't go there for water. Um Maybe I want to make a green juice or something, but everything I'm getting is going to be organic. Got it. 
you know, if it's not from there, I'm going to the farmer's market. Mm. So I would say 80% 80 of the time I'm at the farmer's market because everything I'm making is from whole ingredients. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's quinoa. It's fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. That's awesome. Any yeah. supplements or medications you're taking? Well, no medications. Uh, supplements. Um, my supplements are going to be herbal. So I'll give you a for instance. Because I travel so much, and most people don't understand how much radiation you're getting when you're on the plane, right. it's really important that you do things to sort of break even on that. Mm. And so for me, I'm making sure I always have some sea moss with me, some sea moss gel. Okay. okay. That helps with the radiation? Well, it's, it's not the radiation that's very important. It's gut health. Mm. You know, so with radiation, I'm doing things like medicinal mushrooms. That's the most important thing okay. when it comes to something like that. So medicinal mushrooms like reishi, like turkey tail, like lion's mane, mm. those type of things. Yeah, I heard even the machines you walk through and put your arms like this yeah. is, is terrible for you yeah, at the yeah, airport. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I'm just trying to, I'll, I'm always doing things to make sure, like, I'm offsetting things that, because I live in the modern world, they're just unavoidable. Yeah. You know, I, I, I use a cell phone. I, uh, you know, I, I get on a plane. You know, I got to breathe the same air that you you breathe. Yeah. You know, like I have a filter that filters my whole house in terms of the water, but again, it's filter water. It mm. doesn't get everything. It gets maybe 95% of things. It gets a large percentage of the chloride, a large percentage of the chloramine, mm. some of the heavy metals out, but it doesn't get everything. Right. You know, so for me, when I'm supplementing, I'm supplementing based upon what my needs are. But most of those supplements are going to be in the form of some type of herb or some type of superfood. Mm. Yeah. That water filter was a game changer for me, man. Yep. I just got one last week, and my showers feel way better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that dry skin goes away. You know, I was telling people, we don't understand how polluted our water is here mm. today is either. There's chlorine in there. There's chloramine in there. There's heavy metals in there. We know that because of what happened in Flint, Michigan. Mm. You know, um, there's pharmaceuticals in there as well too they find a large percentage of birth control in in the municipal water as wow. well too so i think a lot of people are just unaware of how poison our food system is here yeah. in the u.s like it's it's poison from the the top down <laughs> you know yeah people be drinking tap water at restaurants i'm like you're crazy yeah yeah and and again it's just about what's public knowledge and i think it's also about People are under the impression that there are agencies that are designed to protect us. Mm. And people are under the impression that they're actually doing their best job to protect us. I definitely was. Yeah. I thought the FDA was here to help. And you were working there, right? So yeah. you got firsthand view of what that was like. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and again, I go to the FDA thinking to myself, man, one day I'll, I'll probably be able to create the miracle drug that helps with cancer. Mm. You know, I'll be a product, part of that process. That's the intention. Right. But and then you go there, you find out, okay, you're sitting in the drug meetings, you're listening to the approvals, and you're realizing that this isn't what I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> and then you find out, I found out actually while I was there that 70% of the funding for the FDA comes from pharmaceutical companies. Wow. And you find out things like if somebody has a drug application, they can pay $350,000 and rush that drug application. Damn. So there's a lot of things you start to find out and you're starting to witness and you're seeing them pass laws to say, okay, it's okay to have genetically modified foods. Mm. And then you're seeing other countries say, no, they're banned. And you're seeing them say, okay, it's okay to have this type of stuff in the water, like, for instance, atrazine. Mm. But other countries have banned it. And you realize that our system is loose and the people who are supposed to be protecting us are not doing that. They're compromised. They're compromised. Yeah, money. Yeah. Yeah. Ozempic's everywhere right now, and I don't know the long-term effects of that. We'll see. Yeah, you know what's crazy is, so I get a lot of questions about that. Because on one side of the equation, it helps a lot of people lose weight. Yeah. You know, you've seen all the movie stars and personalities like Elon Musk who swear by it. Oh, he does? Yeah. The, Damn. Uh, there was a report that he used Ozempic or Rogovi, which, whichever one. Holy, that's surprising to me. I yeah, didn't yeah. Know. Wow. Yeah, and but what people people never read the fine print. There is no drug that does not have side effects. Right. It just doesn't exist. And so that's why every time you're 
in the in the middle of a commercial or middle of programming, what you'll notice is is that probably fifty percent of the commercials are pharmaceutical drug commercials. Mm. And what you'll see is this very brief period where people are smiling and excited <laughs> and happy about getting the drug, and then the rest of the commercial is rifling off all of these side effects. Yeah, yeah. And people just don't believe. I don't know if it's the people don't believe the side effects um, because when you go and pick it up at the pharmacy, the pharmacist is supposed to tell you about them. But I just think people are so enamored with the idea there's a pill for every ill. Mm. And so I think it's the same thing with, you know, these drugs like Ozempic. Most people would think that they can get something for nothing. It just doesn't work like that. And I think that people people believe that I lost weight, this is going to make me healthier. And losing weight is probably one of the greatest things you can do for your health. Mm. But there are factors that come with losing weight. Most people, when they lose weight, it's because they change how they ate and they change how they move with exercise. So the true benefits come, comes from the change in the lifestyle. But you're getting weight loss without having to do any of those things. But right. When you eat healthy foods, you're getting a, a huge amount of nutrients. When you're doing exercising, you're getting an increase of blood flow, you're getting an increase of endorphins. Mm. The list goes on and on, all of the benefits from those things. The weight loss is just a, a, a good side effect of the good behavior. But with this drug, you're not getting that. Right. So what you're seeing is a lot of people are taking the drug, which is what which was initially used for diabetic patients. That's the that's the label used for it. Mm. And what they noticed was people was actually losing weight. And so for when it first came out, a lot of diabetics couldn't even get the drug because so many other people were taking it for <laughs> weight loss. Wow. But the thing is, when you take the drug. You lose weight, but you have to take it indefinitely. Mm. As soon as you stop taking it, you start to gain weight back. Right. And you can't take a drug like that indefinitely. You just can't do it. First of all, it's not economic, economically feasible for you to do it. I think it costs about $1,000 a month. Holy crap. Yeah. In, in Canada, it's $155. And in Germany, it's $59 per month. So <sighs> ask yourself why an American drug Costs more in America, costs less in other countries. That's <laughs> yeah. a whole nother. That's a whole t- podcast that's a whole right whole there. <laughs> topic, but people forget about the side effects. The side effects range from everything from gastroparesis, which is a, a paralysis of the stomach. Hmm. So your stomach doesn't function well, which is a very important thing. Yeah. This is why so many people have digestive issues. It affects your gallbladder, can cause gallstones. It can also cause your gallbladder to be inflamed. Mm. And this is probably why one of the contributing reasons why gallbladder removal surgery is the number one elective surgery. Wow. People will remove their gallbladders and don't even think about it, but they don't think about what the consequences of removing something that is actually necessary. Mm. You know, so that's another side effect. A lot of people have a lot of diarrhea as well, too. So... There's a whole list of side effects that people quite often don't think about, increasing certain cancers as well too, that people aren't thinking about, but they're thinking about the weight loss. Yeah. And they're getting the weight loss with no work put in. And, I, and it's my position that if you manipulate your biochemistry, you do nothing for your health. If you correct your biochemistry, that's when you actually achieve health. And right. unfortunately, most drugs are designed to manipulate your biochemistry. The example that I give people is you can, it, it could be time for an oil change, right? Mm-hmm. And then that light comes on that says time for an oil change. And let's say it's time to get your you know, vehicle registration and you got to get that fixed first, but you don't have time. You can go under the hood and take the battery cable off. It'll reset the car. You can go get your, your tag now, right? Yeah. It doesn't mean that you don't still need an oil change. Mm. And for me, that's what drugs do. It can help you in terms of like manipulating your biochemistry, but it doesn't correct it. Right. And what's dangerous about that is most people who have a heart attack or a stroke are on their meds when they have a heart attack or stroke. Wow. It's not people who are not taking their medications. Yeah. So what that's telling us is that despite the fact that your, your numbers may be quote unquote normal, 
it means that the cause is still there. Mm. You're just addressing the symptoms. The hypertension, the high number, is just a symptom. The obesity is just a symptom. It's not the actual cause or the, the root issue that is happening. Right. So you got to address the root issue. Yeah, people are just putting a Band-Aid on it, right? They're putting a Band-Aid on it's it. It's a deeper wound, and a big part of fixing that is, is diet, like you mentioned earlier with your story. Lifestyle. Uh, diet is just one component of lifestyle. And what I mean by that is you can correct your diet, but if you're sedentary, mm. you don't move. We're designed to move. And up until maybe the 1950s, most jobs were manual labor, and many of them were outside. Mm. So we were moving constantly throughout the day. And not only that, most people were outside, so they were getting exposure to the sun as well today. But, uh, you know, but when you look today, people wake up, get in their cars, travel to their work, go into a covered parking garage, <laughs> walk across a covered <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, platform into their job, sit there for eight hours, and then repeat the process back home. Mm. And so when you look at most people's lifestyle, that's how it looks. And that's not what we're designed to do. I mean, when you look at human history, that just occurred in the last few seconds of human history. Processed foods, sedentary lifestyle, pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, chemicals in our foods, EMF coming from our cell phones, computers, radiation. Yep. That literally just happened in the last second of human existence. So you got to understand, we don't even know what the impact of all this is going to happen, not only to us right now, but to the following generations as well, too. For real. They're saying that EMF from phones can potentially cause cancer down the road. Yeah, it does. And, and they've noticed that. People who, what they'll notice is if somebody constantly uses their phone to their left mm. and they start to get some sort of cancer, it'll be on that left side right wow. there. Wow. So it tells you that, I mean, it tells you that there's an impact there, but nothing has been changed. I mean, they didn't have any problems with rolling out 5G. <laughs> but this, it's like that in every aspect of American culture. Like, yeah. you know, they just send a guard home. You know, nobody's there to protect. Nobody's there to answer to why is it that we're subsidizing foods that are killing us. Mm. And then all the foods that are good for us, like green leafy vegetables, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, you don't see a subsidy for it. You don't see a commercial for it. You don't see the USDA having a commercial for, you know, a salad, yeah. a avocado. You never see those kind of commercials. But you see them for beef. Mm. You see them for dairy. Because those are the industries that are literally propping up the government and doing paying all the money for lobbying. Right, because big food and big pharma, they're in bed together. They're in bed. And, and just think about that. I tell people the most radical thing that you could do is become healthy because it breaks down the entire system mm. that is pitted against us. When you become healthy, just think about it like this, less doctor visits, okay? That means that now an 800 bed hospital probably goes to a 100 bed hospital. When you become healthy, that insurance that you're paying $400 a month for for your family, now it's like, why would I pay that amount of money? Mm when everybody is healthy. So now you're paying maybe $50 for it. You know, when you become healthy, now the pharmaceutical industry goes down. You don't need their drugs. Right. You know, when you become healthy, all of a sudden the food industry that is making the food that is actually killing you, now that food industry becomes obsolete. Mm. So that's why I tell people all of these industries that are literally taking away seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months of our lives, all of these systems go void as soon as you start voting with your dollars and buying food and living a lifestyle that is actually conducive to you actually being healthy. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, instead of fighting them with money, we should just not fight it at all and just go out on our own. Yeah, yeah, start, vo literally, start purchasing food from a farmer who actually has philosophies and practices that are in line with you being healthy with the food, the kind of food that they grow and uh, the way that they grow it. Yeah. You know, like instead of you saying, when I get a headache, I'm going to go get Tylenol or et cetera, you just simply drink more water because you're probably dehydrated. Mm. Like these, when we start to vote with our dollars like that, they can't help but make a different decision as a company. 
Yeah. Because now they're not getting the money. What's your take on microplastics? Man, it's unfortunate, but again, it's another new invention. This is something that you go back 50, 60, 60 years ago, very little use. Right. But now it's everywhere. It's wrapped on our foods. You know, microplastics are also, you know, uh, being used in every aspect of everything we buy. When we buy something, it's wrapped in plastic. When mm. we drink water, it's in plastic. Plastic is literally everywhere. And now it's been filled up in the ocean. So a lot of the fish are filled with microplastics as mm. well, too. And what people don't know about uh, these plastics that are being used is they're not only an issue in terms of like an environmental issue, but a lot of these plastics are carcinogenic and disrupt our hormone system mm. in our bodies as well, too. Scary, man. Super scary because most people, they, they store their food in plastic. Yeah. You know, so like think about that for a second. When you buy a bottle of water, and in this case, you don't, you got glass, so yeah. you don't have to worry about that. But the reason why a bottle of water has a, a date on it, because water doesn't go bad, the plastic goes bad. Mm. And as it starts to go bad, it leaches into the water. So this is why you see a lot of uh, water bottles that say uh, BPA-free. Right. Because BPA or bisphenol A is one of those microplastics that disrupt your hormones. But particularly in men, mm. but also women as well, too. So now you're seeing a lot of hormonal issues as well, too. And when you think about men, and I think we'll talk about it in a second, but like this new feminization of men, this this isn't a new term. This is something that has been put out there for quite some time. And it's been put out there quite some time because what we've noticed is that there's been this trend of men's not only sperm count, but testosterone levels dipping. Right. Dipping. If you go back to 1990, the average testosterone was around about 500. You go to the uh, 2000s, average testosterone is probably about 400. Mm. And today it's around about 300. Holy crap. Now, here's the comparison I want to give you. We can go back and look at our paleo ancestors and look at the bone structures and things of that nature. And most of them are walking around with a testosterone level between 1,000 and 1,500. Dang. And what people don't understand about testosterone, especially as a man, it makes up who you are. And what I mean by that is when your testosterone levels are low, your motivation and your ambition are low. Mm. Okay, and what do we see today? A lot of men who are low in ambition, low in get up and go, right? Yeah. When you, when you think about Men, one of the biggest complaints that I get from men is erectile dysfunction. Yep. Low testosterone, low sexual desire, low testosterone, man boobs, low testosterone. And guess what? Estrogen lowers testosterone. Mm. And the unfortunate thing about these microplastics, they are fake estrogens, xenoestrogens, synthetic est estrogens. And they're everywhere in the environment. They're not, they're not just in plastics. But they're in our soaps. So when you look on your soap and you see alkaphenol or phenol anything, that's a micro, that's a microplastic slash endocrine disruptor. Wow. That increases estrogen in the body. Crazy. Shampoos and soaps, parabens and phthalates, both of these increase estrogen in the body. Mm. When you think about some of the herbicides, the second leading herbicide used in the U.S. is atrazine. Now, the interesting thing about atrazine is that they've done studies on it and they've done the studies in frogs. And what they notice is that when they put a frog in a bat of water that was had about 200 nanograms per liter of the atrazine, the herbicide mm -hmm. that is sprayed on all grains, they were able to convert that frog was converted to a, that male frog converted into a female frog. Now what? That, now that's 200 nanograms per liter. Yeah. You know what's allowed in tap water? How much? The EPA allows 3,000 <sighs> nanograms per deciliter. I mean, 15 per liter. times. So you can see what I'm saying. Like, that's increasing estrogen in the body as well, too. Mm. And people are showering in it, they're people bathing are in it. Bathing in it. So Pools. just think about that. When you take a bath, you're literally 
soaking up all of that. <laughs> like you're crazy. soaking up the chlorine, you're soaking soaking up the chloramine, the lead, the potential mercury. Yeah. The, I, I, like I mentioned before, uh, EE2, which is an estrogen that comes from birth control, also in there as well too. Wow. The atrazine that is running off in the water. I think they found atrazine in about 40% of all tap water. <sighs> So you can see what happens is the long-term exposure to this over the course of time to males is starting to shift the population in terms of like what we look like, how we respond in our personality, mm. and in many cases, our sexuality too. Wow, no wonder that movement's so powerful right now then. Yeah, yeah, it definitely has a contributing factor. And what people just don't know is not just males that it's affecting, it's also affecting females as well too. Mm. Because as their estrogen levels rise, uh, you're also seeing an increase in breast cancer as well too and all the reproductive cancers. Wow. So it's not just on one side of the equation that it's affecting people, it's affecting the entire population. I wonder if there's a fix for the water issue because atrazine's in it, is there a way to remove it at all? Well, I, I, one of the one of the fixes is you definitely gotta get a water filter for the whole house. Now, if you live in an apartment, you won't be able to do that. Mm. But you can do a filter at the point. So you can do a filter for your kitchen. You can do a filter for your shower. Mm. You can do a filter for the bathtub. You can filter at the point. And reverse osmosis filters are some of the best ones to get. But with, when you get your filter, you need to figure out what is it filtering out. And you also can test the water before you get the filter, and then after you get the filter, test the water again, mm. so you can kind of know where you're at. Yeah. But this is a big issue, and the reason why it's a big issue and it's so personal for me is because I see a lot of young men who are depressed. Mm. And in 2022, we saw the largest increase of in males ever. Damn. The record high in 2022. And one of the things that happens when your testosterone is low is depression. And men commit at a rate four times the, that of women. Mm. So it's a real huge issue for us. And I say it's a us issue, not, not a male or a female issue. It's a us issue because these are fathers, sons, you know, uh, uncles, et cetera. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think the, I think so, I think the largest population of men who are committing with those who are under 50, the age of 50. Wow. So it's important for us to know and understand, especially in a, in a culture where I believe that our culture doesn't make room for men to express themselves emotionally. Because we're taught from like a little boy, when we fall down, we start crying, stop crying, right. be a big boy. We're taught, even as men, when there's a problem, we start talking about it, you're being emotional. Mm. So we don't even have a culture to support us in that way, let alone the food culture, the environmental toxin culture that we're having as well today. 100%. Too. So yeah. many guys are scared to open up. Yeah. Yeah, it's a major issue. Doctor, it's been really enlightening. Anything you want to close off with or promote? Man, I just think um, I hope and I wish for people to really take their health serious. I believe that the highest version of you is the heal version of you. Mm. And we have to heal ourselves not only from a lifestyle standpoint, but from a trauma standpoint as well too, from a, a mental and a spiritual standpoint as well too. And I hope that people understand that in the culture that we live in here in the US, which is now spreading to other cultures as well too, that the greatest advocate you have for yourself will only be yourself. Mm. You are your first doctor. Your doctor can't even help you until they ask you questions about you. Tell me what's going on. What are the symptoms? So you should be doing that checkup for yourself every day. 100%. And so um, if people need natural options, um, you know, that's pretty much what I provide and, you know, give them different ways to look at how they can heal themselves through food, through herbal medicine, through being in nature, etc. Amazing. We'll link all your stuff below. Thanks so much for coming on, man. I appreciate you, brother. Yeah, thanks for watching, guys. We'll link everything below if you want to reach out. Otherwise, see you tomorrow.